On this episode of Know How, your embedded devices can be hacked, so protect them. Also, our remote control build continues with power plants. Oh, and uh, did you know that your future fuel cells are going to smell like cat piss? That's right. It's all next on Know How. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Welcome to Know How. It's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I'm Father Robert Ballisier, the digital Jesuit, and unfortunately, I'm not joined by my regular host, Cranky Hippo, Brian Burnett. He and uh, Alex Gumpel, who is normally my TD, they are both at a marriage together. So we want to wish them all the best. Please tweet out them at Cranky Hippo and NL3. Many years of happiness to come. There we go. And see, childhood friends made good. Although let's get right to it. A, a couple of weeks ago some folks were talking to me about alternate ways of storing power. Now we've always been talking about battery power or increasing battery efficiency by dumping carbon nanotubes into the chemistry. But one of the most promising technologies, the technology that's within our grasp is the hydrogen fuel cell. Now I know, I know we've heard a lot about this but the problem with a hydrogen fuel cell has always been storage and transportation of hydrogen. Hydrogen, as you know, tends to be kind of explodey. And we don't like explodey. We like things to be safe, especially when you're fueling vehicles. Hydrogen can be a difficult tool to bear. Well, some researchers in the UK have figured out a way to make hydrogen on demand while also making it very transportable, very safe, and therefore very cost effective. Now, how do they do it? They do it by not using hydrogen. Yeah, that, that's right. They, they use hydrogen and they make it safe by not letting it be hydrogen, free hydrogen, that's H2, at any given moment. They've developed a process by which they can take ammonia, with it, which is just NH3, one, one atom of nitrogen and three atoms of hydrogen, and break it apart on demand so that for every two molecules of ammonia, you get one molecule of nitrogen and three molecules of hydrogen. The, 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 the ramifications for this are absolutely fantastic. First, ammonia is stable. Yeah, it doesn't smell great. It does smell a little like cat piss. That's why we had the teas. But it won't blow up. I mean, by itself. It, uh, the, the molecular ammonia, as long as it's pure, is going to be relatively easy to transport, relatively safe to store, and very easy to fill. In fact, you fill it just like you would fill the car of your, your uh, petrol-powered vehicle right now. It's, you use a plastic tank and you dump ammonia into it, and then it gets pumped over a catalyzer, which would break apart the hydrogen from the nitrogen, thus giving you your hydrogen. Now, the, the reason why they're allowed to, they're able to do this, the breakthrough that they made wasn't the ability to, to crack apart ammonia. In fact, we've been cracking apart ammonia for many, many years. The, the breakthrough was that they figured out a way to do it without a metallic catalyst. That's been the limiting factor. Those catalysts tend to be expensive, very, very expensive. And so they've, uh, they've created a reactor. It's about the size of a two-liter bottle that will do all the cracking with a simple chemical process chemicals that are catalysts themselves, not using any metal, not using any precious ores, not using anything that's expensive or difficult to replace. This is a breakthrough. Now, what does this all mean? Okay, well, first of all, it means now we've got uh, a way to fill in that last mile, that, that part of the hydrogen fuel cell economy that we thought was too dangerous. It also means that devices like this, this is actually a fuel cell itself. This is a reactor. This takes hydrogen, pure hydrogen, in through this inlet, and uh, it gives you power. In fact, five volts of power, one amp, enough to charge USB devices. You stack enough of these together, and you now have enough power to drive a car, or a bus, or a house, or a city. Now. Previously, we'd, we'd had to use things like this. This is just silicate. So this takes a little bit of water and it starts cracking it apart and it releases ammonia, but this only works for a while. If, if I now had a way to safely store hydrogen, to, to sequester it away into the chemical bonds of ammonia, then it means I could drive more of these without worrying about exploding. Now, 
Now, we don't know exactly how the reactor works. That's it's kind of a black box. I'm sure they're a little worried that people are going to try to copy them. But we can guess as to how the reaction is going to work. Tony, if you go ahead and go back to that graphic, what you see is you need to start with water. And you have to be able to crack the water apart. You need to pull H2O, which is two atoms of hydrogen and, and one atom of oxygen, and pull it apart. Typically, we do this through electrolysis. By running power through water, we get hydrogen on one side, we get oxygen on the other. Now, with that free hydrogen and that free oxygen, after you've split it apart, you combine it with nitrogen. Now, nitrogen is found all over our atmosphere. You use a process by which you combine hydrogen and nitrogen in a high-pressure container. You run it over a catalyst, and over time, it will turn into liquid nitrogen. It's, a, it's an endothermic reaction. In, in other words, energy has to go in to form the compound. Now, once we're done with that, that not nitrogen, not that ammonia, it is very, very stable. You can transport it anywhere until you need to convert it back into hydrogen. And to do that, you run it th either through a catalyst or through their reactor. You get nitrogen freed up, you get hydrogen, and then when it runs through the fuel cell, all you get is heat, power, and water. It's a fantastic way to close the power gap, to close the power loop, and, uh, oh, I don't know, to make us a little greener. Now, let's put away our energy for a while and talk a little bit about Doge. Now, if you go and bring up the link for this, uh, this story, Tony, this, this is an interesting story that popped up a few weeks back, talking about how some devices had, got, had gotten hacked, allowing a hacker, a malicious hacker, to use their their uh, NASs, their Synology NASs, to hack Dogecoins. Actually, no, that's for the hydrogen fuel cell. You, you need, there we go. Now, now, Synology admits that they got hacked, but this is, this is the story. Earlier this year, owners of Synology network-attached storage boxes, they noticed that their NASs were getting sluggish with abnormally high CPU usage. Well, after a little research, it was found that the boxes had been infected with malware that installed itself into a folder labeled, of course, owned. Now, this malware was using the processing power of the Synology box, which is actually quite powerful. These boxes contain dual-core Atom CPUs. They have at least a gigabyte of memory. So in parallel, com compromising tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these boxes, they actually got a decent amount of power. In fact, enough power to mine about 500 million Dogecoin. Which, which is actually about the equivalent of $620,000. But that's not the story. The story is this. Synology found this vulnerability back in September of 2013. They released a patch that closed the vulnerability in their Linux-based disk station manager operating system on September 23rd. It was just a few days later. And they made the patch a part of their next major operating system. But it was only in February of this year that that report started rolling in of people complaining about the sluggish performance. Go ahead and come back to me. In fact, switch to my uh, to, to the uh, the side view here of uh, the, the table. This is a Synology box. This is a 713 Plus. This is one of the boxes that I, I use. I actually have quite a few of these. It's a two-bay device. Now, the nice thing about this is that it has the ability to automatically download updates and tell you when they're available. Unfortunately, people didn't do that which is why I want to show you really quickly how much time it takes to enable that. Tony, if you go ahead and run that video, it shows you the update process I, I made to a, uh, a 713 that was inside of an IO safe enclosure. Uh, go ahead and, uh, yeah, have to, there you go. This allows you really easily to, to just check this box, and it will, it will download uh, updates regularly. Then you just click the Update Now button, and uh, everything will take care of itself. Now, the, what, what just baffles my mind is that with a process that is so easy, so automatic, and so simple that people aren't doing it. Folks, if you've got a Synology product right now, go ahead and run the update. You even get this brand new disk station manager, which looks a little nicer, has a few more features, and is definitely more secure. So if, if you are on a NAS, if you have one in your, uh, in your lab, in your office, in your home, be it from Synology, Netgear, or actually even if it's not a NAS, if it's a router, if it's a device hooked up to your network, I I'm going to make a plea to you to please, please make sure you go through regular updating. Go ahead and find out whatever you need to do to log in, to check to see if there's a new firmware and update it. Because when you do, you're going to be able to get rid of things like, oh, I don't know, making someone else a lot of Dogecoin.
Now, when we come back, we're going to get to the meat of the show. I want to show you all about the RC bill that we've been talking about. Last time, we showed you what the transmitters look like. We showed you how they actually work, how you can transmit instructions from one point to the other. Now, we're going to show you how you turn that instruction into power. But until then, let's take a trip to Maker Faire. If you've been to enough of these shows, you've probably seen cyberpunk. It's dark, it's gritty, and most of the time, it's beautiful. But what exactly makes cyberpunk, and how do you make these beautiful pieces of costume? Well, I'm here with Trevor from Subverse Industries, and he's going to tell us, well, what is steampunk? Trevor? Well, uh, steampunk is uh, sort of reimagining um, of modern art, technology, and culture, but through the lens of Victorian era aesthetic and culture. Steampunk is such a wonderful combination of, of as you said, that retro-futuristic. You laser guns with steam cannons and, and holsters made out of leather. That it, it, It's almost a style that people can't describe, but they know it the minute they see it. Right, yeah, that's the beautiful thing about steampunk because it's so collaborative and there's so many right ways to do it. Uh, if you are a tinkerer, you can make something that's steampunk and it's instantly recognizable as steampunk. Uh, you can come at it from the fashion angle, from all the literature, the, the novels out there. It's just such a robust world and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's an amazing collaboration. Okay, Trevor, I got to ask you about your collection behind you because everything behind us is handmade, designed by you and your team. And, and I have to say, I've seen some bad steampunk in my days. They made good attempts, but not quite there. How do you go about actually designing the holsters and the hats and all the accoutrements that, that make your style? Well, uh, uh I got to give credit to to my community. You know, it's it's really uh, I'm inspired by the people around me all the time. It's a lot of uh, beautiful characters. Uh, the whole the whole Bay Area, specifically steampunk community, is just vibrant and amazing. And uh, you know, it it starts there. And then I think about function and and form, and uh, throw in a little passion and love, and and we end up with some pretty awesome stuff. I think. Now, I, I really enjoyed that steampunk booth, and uh, I've been trying to get into it. If there are any makers in the area, California, the Bay Area, and you want to get on know-how, and you've got the skills to make something interesting, please go ahead and contact me on Twitter at PadreSJ. Now, remote control. For the older members of the audience, you probably dabbled with remote control. Everyone was doing it back in the 80s and the 90s. It was fun to make models that moved. I mean, it was one thing to make a fighter jet that sat on the wall or a nice model of a car that sat on top of your bed. But to make a remote control plane, boat, car, well, that was a different thing. Oh, you can buy yourself a kit. And some of these kits are actually pretty advanced. This is something that I received a couple of years back. I showed this off last year. It's, it's actually a decent remote control vehicle, and it will show you all the principles. But the problem is it's ready to run. It comes pre-assembled, which means that if you're doing this to learn a few things, to find out how remote control works, how transmissions are assembled, how the power plant is put together, this won't be a really good way to do that. I mean, you can disassemble it, but what's the point of that? Instead, we thought you should probably buy yourself a kit. And uh, we've gone with this. This is the lunchbox. This is something that, uh, again, this is from the 80s. It's an old model. We, we got it because it has a huge chassis, which gives us a lot of opportunity to play with the different parts of the remote control. I'm going to call it a fetish. Yeah, it's a fetish. Everything from the, the big monster truck wheels to an oversized transmission to a, a unibody, which mounts everything. Now, what I really like about assembling a kit like this is you need to put it together. You don't buy this from a store and, and turn it on the next day. If you don't put together all the gears properly, if you can't assemble a transmission, if you don't know how a power plant runs, well, you're just not going to get any of enjoyment. So if you have a kid, or if you have a kid at heart, that's what we're going to be doing the next couple of episodes. We're going to teach you how to turn this into something like this. Now, again, last time we were here, we talked a little bit about the actual trans transmitter, the transmitter and the receiver, the way that your RC system talks to the model. 
Now, what we, we told you was that using crystals so that the transmitter and the receiver are on the same frequency, you could transmit signals, instructions from your transmitter unit to your receiver unit. But the question is, what happens to those signals, to those instructions, once they get there? Specifically, what we're going to cover today is how do you get go? And we want go. I mean, if it doesn't go, why are you doing it in, in the first place? So what we need to do is we need to talk about the power plant. That's right, the little electric motors, and we're talking about electric here, you can buy these with nitro fuel, but let's, let's do electric because, again, I don't like people who blow themselves up. We want to show you the two different types of electric motors that you can get for your RC models. Now, specifically, they're called brushed and brushless. Now, I know we're gonna get technical here, but this is know-how, you're all geniuses, so you'll be able to figure this out really quickly, and you understand why one is important, uh, why it's, it's important to know one from the other. Now, a brushed motor is very simple. Tony, if you go ahead and bring up that, that uh, there we go. So this is what a brushed motor looks like. This is in its most basic form. You've got a battery, you've got that, which is a power source. You've got an armature that contains the shaft, a tightly wound coil of wire, a commutator, and the assembly into which the armature is mounted, which will contain the brushes, as you, as you can see, a rotating mount, which allows the armature to spin on its axis, and a permanent magnet. You could actually build this. This is, this is a perfect model of something that you could throw together in a garage and you would get rotational motion out of it. Now, the way that it works is this. If you go ahead and uh, forward to that next video, uh, the battery provides current to the brushes. Now, the brushes are gonna make contact with the commutator and the commutator will allow the current to flow through the wire loop. Uh, go ahead, and, there you go. Now, the current flows through a loop of wire, which will create a magnetic field. I mean, if you've ever done this in grade school, if you put current through a coil of copper cable, it will create a positive and a negative pole. In other words, it's an electromagnet. Well, when you create that magnetic field, the magnetic field will interact with the magnetic field of the permanent magnet, which will also have a positive pole and a negative pole. Now, okay, here we go, magnetism 101. Like poles will repel, and opposite poles will attract. That means the positive side of the charged coil will be pushed away from the positive side of the permanent magnet and drawn to the negative side of the permanent magnet. At the same time, the negative side of the charged coil will be pushed away from the negative side of the permanent magnet and drawn to the positive side of the permanent magnet. Because of this, the shaft on which the coil rests, because it's in a, in a mount, will turn. However, if that's all it was, then it would stop at 179 degrees. It would turn one way until the poles were lined up, negative to positive on both sides, and then it would turn no more. Obviously, 179 degrees of motion isn't really enough for us. We, we want to get constant motion. We want to get constant movement. We want to get constant power out of our motors. So all electric motors depend on one important Thing. The secret is the commutator. Now, in a brushed motor, the commutator is the part of the armature that is connected to the coil. And I believe this is uh, where you're going to run another video, Tony. That makes the electromagnetic field that connects to the brushes on the assembly. Now, the commutator has two jobs. The first is to transfer power from a fixed point to the armature. Imagine you've got a, a rotating assembly. So obviously, you can't just have a wire that brings current into the coil because eventually the wire would run out of length, it would spool around itself and it would break. So this allows you to have a fixed point, those two brushes, that are transferring current into the coil through the commutator. However, more importantly, the commutator reverses the polarity of the current flowing through the armature. See how, see how it, the red and the blue will peri periodically go from one brush to the other. Every time they go from one brush to the next, they will flip polarity. And every time they flip polarity, they will flip the magnetic field being generated by the coil. That means that every time you get close to having a, 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 a static field, so positive to negative, it will flip to make it positive to positive, negative to negative, and it continues on its way. You do this several thousand times a second, and you have yourself an electric motor. There you go, folks. There is a brushed DC motor. Now, brushed DC motors have a couple advantages. The first is they're actually pretty cheap. It, we've been making these things for over 150 years, so that we've kind of got the technology down. They've also, they're very easy to control as far as speed is concerned, because there's only one control, power. 
you dump more current into the motor, it goes faster. It's, it's actually pretty simple. There's, there's no voodoo, there's no magnetism. I mean, there's, I mean, magnetism, there is magnetism. There's no, there's no ICs in here, there's no electronic sensors. It's a simple, dumb electronic device. Put power in, get motion out. Also, you get really good low-end torque. If you've ever driven in an electric vehicle, you know what it feels like to stomp on the accelerator and just feel it fly. That's because all of the torque of an electric motor is at the start of its turning. So at the very first, when it just first starts start, uh, turning, that is the most torque you will ever get out of that motor, and then it drops off. Versus a gas motor where the power band hovers between three and 6,000 RPM. So you have to speed up before you can actually get that low end power. Now that's a brushed motor. The disadvantages of using this is that the brushes, because they're touching the commutator, will eventually wear out. And when the brushes wear out, you either have to replace it or you throw away the motor, more likely the second because these are so cheap. The second disadvantage is that there will be an electrical arc every time you switch the commutator. In fact, uh, Tony, if you could go back to that animation. You see, you, you remember that, that small that moment where you flip polarities? Well, when you do that, when the brushes make contact with the next section of the commutator, there's going to be a slight electrical arc. That electrical arc is actually going to cause a bit of I guess, like a spot weld on the commutator, and it's also going to cause premature wear of the brushes. So that's, you know, although they're cheap and although they're very easy to use, they're not always the most reliable thing to have in your RC model. So let's go from this to this. This is a brushless motor. Now, mostly you've seen these in uh, quadcopters. Quadcopters use them a lot because the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the auto sensing that is inside the motors is actually perfect for the fine control that you need to balance a, uh, a craft in flight. Now, what do I mean by, by that? Tony, so go ahead and go back to my wide shot. Uh, what I mean is that unlike a, uh, uh, the, okay, let's start with this. Most of the parts of a <clears throat> brushless motor are the same as a brushed motor. You're going to have a coil of wire. You're going to have an armature. You're going to have a permanent magnet. You're going to have a commutator. The only real difference is A, the magnet is the part that spins, not the coil. And B, the commutator is electrical. It's not mechanical. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there is a power source, there is an armature, there is a shaft, there is a coil that generates the electric field, there's a permanent magnet, and there's a commutator that flips the current going through the coil and therefore flips the magnetic field, but the shaft, the part that spins, is actually connected not to that little coil that we saw in the first diagram, but rather to the magnet, right? So if you look at this animation, imagine that the magnet is the part that is rotating. That's actually perfectly possible because right here, the only reason why the magnet's not rotating is because it's being held down by the mount. Now, if we do the exact same process, but we don't move the armature, we don't move the coil, you get movement from the magnet, and that's what makes a brushed motor. Now, the other part is because there is no mechanical commutator, it means that uh, you have to use a sensor. There's a sensor inside every brushed motor that detects the position of the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the magnet. And, and then it, sh it automatically will shift the magnetic field, the polarity of the current flowing through the coil to make that magnet continue to spin on the axis. What this means is that in a brushless motor, it tends to be a bit more expensive. Not, not, not a whole lot now because they're being manufactured in bulk, but for the, the, the nice ones that you can get for remote, remote control aircraft, whereas this one might cost you about $14, this one will probably cost you about 60 So yeah, there is a price increase, just know about that. However, there's a lot of advantages to using a brushless motor. The first is, because there are no brushes, because there's no contact, you don't have to worry about brushes wearing out. So they are gonna last a lot longer. Also, because the commutation, the flipping of the magnetic field is done electronically rather than mechanically, you don't have to worry about that arc effect, which again means that your motor is going to last longer. Now, they, again, they, uh, they do tend to be a bit more expensive and they are slightly more fragile, so just keep that in the back of your mind. All right, so that's all the theory. Theory is great, but now we want to see it actually in action. How does this work? Go ahead and go to my overshot, Tony, and uh, I'm going to show you exactly how this works. Now, if you could go to the overhead shot. 
There you go. All right, so I've got a, a few different types of models here. I've got the quadcopter, which uh, we kind of, we burked it. Uh, yeah, so it, it will fly again. I swear it will fly again, even though I kind of ripped one of the motors out. Now, this is our standard little remote control model here. Uh, now, if you notice, let me go ahead and give this a little bit of power, um, like so. I'm going to flip this over so that this doesn't actually fly off the table. I've got my remote control here, and if I turn this wheel, it will turn the steering servo, which will allow the, uh, the wheels to move in one direction or the next. Now, oh, hold on, there we go. Uh, now, we've also got a throttle. The throttle is controlled by the little thumb grip. So if I pull this, it's going to slowly, oh, by the way, this is a four-wheel drive vehicle. It's going to make it go forward, back, or brake. Now, uh, the, the way that that works, as we explained yesterday, is it has a, a, a transmitter and a receiver that receives instructions and allows me to transmit levels from the remote to the receiver. All right, now, how does that actually work in practice? Now that I know that it, it will work, now that you've seen it work, how can I make it work on my model? Simple. I use something like this. Go ahead and go to my side shot so I can give them a little closer view of what this actually looks like. So when I have a power plant, every power plant on every good remote control vehicle is going to start with the battery. Now this is a 3800 milliamp hour lithium uh, battery. 7.2 volt is sort of the standard for remote control models. You can go 8.4. In fact, I have gone 8.4. In fact, on the model that I'm going to be building to race against Brian, don't tell him, but I'm going to make him use a 7.2 ba volt battery and I'm going to use an 8.4. Shh, that's a secret just between you and me. So that is where my power is going to come from. When I induce current in my electric motor, when I create the field, the power to make that field is coming from here. All right, now we go from there to this. This little device is called an ESC. It's an electronic speed controller. The idea is instead of a servo, because in the old remote control models, you had a servo like this that was connected to a little plate. And as the servo moved back and forth, the, it would make a brush move across the plate and the plate was connected to a resistor. So that would, uh, that would determine how much power actually made it to the engine. They've done away with that because it was clunky and dangerous and made a lot of people get burned. And instead, they've created a, a solid state device. This receives the signals from your transmitter, which is uh, from, from your receiver, which is right here. And it turns it into a signal that, uh, 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 that lets the electronic speed controller know how much power it's going to deliver to your motor. Of course, we've got the receiver. The receiver is right here. This one's actually tied to this transmitter, not to the, the, the pistol grip. Uh, and it works exactly the same way as the one that was in here. In fact, I could, I could switch these and I could drive the servos and the motors with either one of these controllers. Now, this controller is interesting because if you, if you look at it, let me pull this apart. This controller is actually, it's got three leads like that, which means it was designed for a brushless motor. It was designed for one of these, because remember, brushless motors need the sensing capability. You, need, you have a sensor that tells you exactly where the shaft is at any given time. We're not using a brushless motor. We're using a brushed motor. Now, this controller has the ability to use brushed motors by just using two of the leads and switching the, uh, the, uh, the setup on the controller. Not all ESCs have that. Make sure you look at the instructions very closely before you buy. If you're going on Amazon to get yourself a controller, make sure you buy a controller that is either for a brushless or for a brushed motor, depending on which one you plan to buy. All right, now, I've got my receiver, I've got my controller, I've got my motor. All I need to do is give it power and make sure that I haven't done anything that will electrocute me. I'll turn on my transmitter and I'll connect it to my 7.2 volt battery like so. Once I turn it on, oh, actually I should probably hook up a servo here so that uh, you can all see the steering. Uh, remember I need two channels. I need one channel that will control the steering and I need a second uh, channel that will control the, uh, the throttle. All right now if I turn on the transmitter, and the receiver, you'll see this servo. As I move back and forth, the servo, the servo will, will shift back and forth. This is the, gonna be the one that's connected to the linkage of the lunchbox. This will allow me to steer back and forth. Uh, you can buy bigger servos, and the bigger the servo, the more force it will be able to put out as you, you, uh, you make your, your signal input. 
Uh, but this is just about right using a little bit of Archimedes and leverage to move the wheels even on something as big as the lunchbox. Here's the really cool part. The throttle, this thing right here, is not connected to a servo. It's connected to this electronic speed controller, which means when I start turning this, um, let's see if you can hear it. It actually gives you very fine control of how fast it's gonna run. Now you could buy different size motors. This is a standard 540, but you can get anything from a 380, which is a much smaller motor. It's actually closer in size to something like you have on this model, uh, all the way up. You can also custom torque your motor. Uh, I remember when I was when growing up with models, it used to be that there was a really good way to fine tune your engine so that you could use the exact same model as everybody else and get a little more power. Oh, I just love that sound. It reminds me of childhood. Now this, folks, is what your basic power plant is gonna look like. Go ahead and come back to my wide. If you're building a model, you need to think about this because I, I, it, one of the biggest mistakes people will make in building a model is that the transmitter and the powertrain are an afterthought. It's just something that they run to the store because they, oh, I, we forgot to get a transmitter, or oh, we forgot to get an electronic speed control, or oh, well, we don't, we don't have a motor in the kit, so let's just go buy the cheapest one we, we have. You can spend as much or as little as you want on the transmitter, but it gets to be a choice you make. More expensive transmitters will have more channels. More channels means you can do more things. For example, one of the models I created early on was a four-channel model. One was for steering, one was for throttle, one was to aim the cannon on top of the car, and channel four was to fire. So I'm not saying that you make yourself a cannon car, but uh, you could. Now, when we come back next time, we're actually going to start to show you how you assemble a model car. We're going we're gonna to take you through step by step on what it takes to put a kit like this with all this power plant equipment into a real live working model. Until that time, though, I'm Father Robert Balliser, and uh, I want to thank you for watching Know How, even if we're a cranky hippolyst episode of Know How. If you want to find out about anything that we talked about today, from, from hydrogen fuel cells to what you need to update your NAS box to everything about RC power plants, be sure to drop by our show notes. You can find us at twit.tv slash kh. That's Know How, where you'll find each and every single episode of the show, along with what I think are some of the best show notes in the business. On that page, you'll also find a way to follow us if you want to automatically subscribe so you get know-how downloaded to your device of choice. If you want it on your iPad, your iPhone, your Android phone or tablet, your laptop, your desktop, we'll do it all for you because, well, we love you because this show is for you. You can also email us at knowhow at twit.tv. We forwarded that email to, uh, to Jeff Needle, so please send us as much email as possible. He won't read it, but it'll be funny to watch him complain every single week. Also, you can find it, follow us on Google+. Plus. If you go to gplus.to slash twitkh, you'll find our G Plus community. It's 65, 6,600 members and growing. It's a fantastic place to ask questions or to give advice to young builders, makers, and DIYers. Also, you can find me on Twitter at twitter.com slash padresj. That's at Padre SJ. If you follow me, you'll find out not only what we're going to be doing in every episode of Know How, you'll be able to suggest ideas for future episodes of Know How, and you'll find out what I do during the week, moving between Know How, Coding 101, and uh, uh, what is that show I do on Monday? This Week at Enterprise Tech here on the Twit TV Network. Until next time, now that you know how, go do it. Go to, go to the overhead shot. Oh, no. It's alive! It also has brake function. I wonder what test it has. Oh! Okay, I should not do that. I should not. Actually, watch. Wait. Speed it up. Faster. Faster. And hey, anyone want to see Newton's Law in action? And brake. Whoa!